Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So uh, what we're going to do today is uh, do a real like, general overview of the, the research I've done. Uh, the title is Fragment Molecular Orbital Molecular Dynamics. What I, I broadly do is computational chemistry. So computational chemistry is a very, very large field. Uh, it includes, you know, the, the MD kind of overlaps a lot of computational biology. Uh, what I do is ab initio or quantum chemistry. And so ab initio here means from first principles. So really the starting point of what we do is the uh, time independent Schrodinger equation. So everyone knows this equation, uh, H psi equals E psi, where psi is your wave function, H is your Hamiltonian operator, and E is your energy. So you know, this equation was discovered back in the 20s. Uh, and it turns out it's really, really hard to solve exactly. So we can apply the Born-Oppenheimer approximation to uh, separate the nuclear and electronic wave functions. And for chemists, we're really only interested in the electronic part. Uh, and even that's still basically impossible to solve exactly. So for like the last 80 years, quantum chemists have basically developed a hierarchy of methods uh, to solve it, uh, the uh, electronic Schrodinger equ equation approximately. Uh, and our starting point for a lot of what we do is, is what's called Hartree-Fock. And so the reason the time-independent Schrodinger equation is difficult to solve is we have electron-electron repulsion interactions, and, and those are really hard to account for exactly. Hartree-Fock accounts for these in an approximate manner, so each electron kind of sees the average of the position of all the other electrons. Uh, and, and basically, we can use Hartree-Fock then for more accurate methods, and so we kind of use that as a zeroth order solution. Uh, Hartree-Fock's not very accurate, and so then when we add these other methods, uh, configuration interaction, if you've heard of full CI, perturbation theory, uh, the common version, if you've heard of molar plus or second order perturbation theory, uh, DFT, which is kind of ubiquitous now in, in actual computations, and something called couple cluster. So these are all like basically a hierarchy of methods. Within these methods, we have various hierarchies as well. And, and these have been very, very successful over the last 80 years of, of development to where for like if we have small molecules with nothing weird going on, let's say we're in a ground state, uh, you know, we don't have any metals, uh, we don't have any radicals, uh, we can solve you know, energies and geometries and chemical properties of molecules very, very accurately to, to where I kind of consider that to be a, a solved problem uh, in a way. Uh, there's still research going on with this. So like if you saw Devin's poster last night, he's doing like quintuple excitations for a couple clusters. So we can still Work, for, uh, work towards doing more accurate stuff, but we can do this very, very well. So what's the problem? The problem is uh, it, what's called the scaling problem. And so kind of inherent or innate to all these methods we talked about on the previous page is, is they all scale very, very poorly. So Hartree-Fock, which is not very accurate, scales formally as n to the 4, where we can think as n as being roughly our system size. Uh, MP2, which is second-order perturbation theory, uh, which is fairly accurate, scales into the fifth, and something like CCSD parentheses T, or couple cluster with singles and doubles excitations and perturbative triples, scales formally into the seven. So if we double our system size, it's going to take 128 times as long uh, just, just formally to, to do the calculation. And that's really unfortunate. So like, let's say we have just this small little peptide molecule up there. Uh, we can probably do that on a single core w with a, a decent sized basis set, oh, a small basis set at this level, like on the order of minutes. But you know, that, that's really not that interesting. And something my group is interested in doing is doing like biomolecules and doing those quantum mechanically instead of using force fields. And so if you take something like a decent sized biomolecule, you know, it might be 10,000 times as large as that. If you want to do a couple clusters, single doubles, and perturbative triples, you know, it's 10,000 to the seven times as long. All of a sudden, your 10-minute calculation becomes like on the orders of decades or centuries on a single core. Uh, and and so, so that's totally intractable. Uh, you know, we can do parallel computing uh, in HPC to approach this problem. But, you know, if you're talking like on the orders of decades, even if you use HPC, you, you're really, you still can't attack the problem uh, in a tractable manner. So. Uh, this problem has been well known for, for a long time. And so one of the ways people have gone about solving this problem uh, was the idea that chemistry is largely local. And what I mean by this is, you know, we think about like functional groups when we took uh, gen chem, how like, you know, we can kind of break chemistry up into substituent blocks. So like if I have this atom right here, it's really affected by this atom a lot more than it's affected by like this atom down here. And this makes a lot of intuitive sense to us. Uh, the problem is with these standard methods I was talking about previously, they don't really recognize that idea. And they treat this atom acting on this atom basically the same way as they treat this atom acting on this atom. And so we waste a lot of computation uh, doing you, you know, uh, integrals and, and stuff of that manner that, that really doesn't affect our final answer. 
And so there's two large ways we can go about kind of taking advantage of this, where we can throw away a lot of our computation that we do that's kind of unnecessary to the final answer. Uh, one's the idea of local methods, which I'm not going to talk about. And one's the idea of fragment-based methods, which is what I do. So for fragment-based methods, if we have this like big biomolecule, we basically divide it up into little chunks. And instead of doing a calculation on a big chunk, we do lots of small calculations on the individual chunks. And therefore, we kind of avoid that high nonlinear scaling. Uh, the other nice thing about fragment-based methods for like HPC is, is they're pretty easy to parallelize because we have a bunch of individual little fragments. So we can just kind of farm those out to, to, to our nodes. And, and so it's kind of you know not quite embarrassingly parallel, but, but it's quite easy to parallelize. Uh, so you know, fragmentation is a, a powerful idea, but it's not a particularly novel idea. And, and so, so there's you know, numerous, numerous methods in the literature of it. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about is fragment molecular orbital method. So uh, FMO, or fragment molecular orbital method, was introduced in 1999. So the first thing you need to do for an FMO calculation is you actually have to divide your system up into fragments. Uh, so I work a lot with clusters and molecular clusters, so like boxes of water, which is really kind of as boring as it sounds. But uh, uh, for that, it's really, really easy. If I have a box of 64 waters, you just make each water a cluster. Uh, for uh, bonded systems, it's a little harder. So with the idea that chemistry is local, we don't want to like destroy delocalized electron charge. So like if we have benzene rings, we don't want to divide benzene rings up into, into multiple fragments. So we kind of want to keep any delocalized electron charge in the same fragment. So it requires a little chemical intuition compared to some of those other fragmentation methods I was talking about previously. But it's really nothing beyond like a freshman level of chemistry, right? maybe like an organic level of chemistry. So it's possible to screw up, but it's still pretty easy. Uh, once we have our system, what we actually do is uh, we do a, basically a quantum chemistry calculation on each small part. So like I have that biomolecule here. So like I do a RHF calculation on each of the individual pieces. And basically, we account for all the other pieces in a classical way instead of doing quantum mechanically. So basically, this piece sees these other two pieces through a coulombic interaction or a classical interaction. We do a calculation on this piece, and it sees these other two pieces classically, and likewise with this third one. So this uh, coulombic field is changing each time because we're doing these quantum calculations on each individual pieces. So we have to update this field, and we have to iterate this process to self-consistency. So once this process is iterated to self-consistency, we have our monomer densities. At this point, uh, we actually do a calculation on pairs of, of monomers, or a dimer calculation, to recover two-body properties. If we are doing a bonded system, this is where we're going to recover our bonding. And this is once again done in the field, the electrostatic field of all the other fragments. Uh, this is not iterated to self-consistency, unlike the monomer. Uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, it'd be very, very expensive to do uh, computationally, and we kind of think of it as a small correction on top of it. Uh, also, it's not clear how you would update the density uh, of the electrostatic potential, since you'd have lots of possible dimer pairs to what you would update. So this is kind of important for the gradient that we're going to talk about later for FMO and D. So uh, schematically, once we've done our calculation, we have to, have to like sum up the individual pieces to get the, uh, the energy of the total system. So the first part we do is the FMO1. And so this is just the monomer energy. So it's like this in the field of these two, this in the field of these two, and this in the field of these two. If we sum up all those monomer energies, we get what's known as FMO1. Uh, that's not very accurate and, and really is never done. If I then add dimer contributions, so these two in the field of that one, these two in the field of that one, and these two in the field of that one, uh, and I subtract off the monomer energy. So this is kind of what I meant by the dimers being a, a small correction to the monomer energies. We get FMO2, which is kind of the, the, the standard uh, FMO is done at the second level. And if trios are important for three-body properties, like maybe in water, uh, we can do uh, FMO3. And we have to do a little extra algebra here to avoid double counting. So uh, FMO works pretty well. Uh, it kind of depends on the system size for what kind of scaling you get uh, uh, compared to the full method. I did uh, protonated water clusters at a fairly high level of theory and a decent basis set on uh, Intrepid. And I was seeing, like, I don't know, like 40 times faster speed up, let's say. So it's so a significant amount of speed up, but it kind of depends on the system size. As far as accuracy, uh, FMO is normally, like, at the th FMO3 level, it's within, like, a kcal per mole uh, uh, of the full answer for the systems we've benchmarked on. Obviously, when you get to two biggest systems, you can't really run the benchmarking calculation uh, because you actually can't submit the, the full problem uh, and get an answer out. So. For quantum chemistry, uh, gradients are very important. So gradients allow us to do geometry optimizations. They allow us to get properties. So at the same time FMO was derived, they derived a, a gradient as well. Uh, so FMO is not fully variational. And that basically means that the energy is not at a minimum with, with respect to all the, all the parameters. And 
what that means is uh, basically, that, that since we don't optimize that density in the dimer calculation, uh, our, our gradient's a little more complicated to solve. And so it requires a solution of something called the coupled perturbed hartree fock equations, which we're not going to show those. But uh, originally, they were thought to be difficult to solve. And so it was thought it would be a very, very small contribution. And so that contribution was just ignored. Uh, when you look at papers at the time, the gradient's termed near fully analytic. And, and that's kind of uh, used everywhere in the papers. Uh, but near fully analytic really means not analytic. And, and so we really didn't have an analytic gradient. But they checked it for geometry optimizations. And for geometry optimizations, we were close enough. But the problem was, you know, we're interested in doing ab initio MD uh, because, you know, there's certain processes in nature that, that are quantum mechanical. And, you know, the force fields work very, very well. But, but, you know, we would really like to do quantum mechanical MD. And so FMO was partly developed in part that was the idea that we could do these quantum mechanical calculations using molecular dynamics because we would speed up our calculation. So in 2003, they actually interfaced FMO with MD. But since this bad gradient was what was used, or was only the thing that was available, that's what they used. And so that led to a problem of, of energy conservation. So what we're looking at here is a log-log graph for the time step versus the RMSD of the energy. And so we're using Verlet integrating here, or the Verlet integrator. And so you can basically show that if we have an analytic gradient, uh, since the Verlet integrator has air ordered uh, two, that this should be a straight line with slope of two. And so we're comparing to basically no fragmentation or the full hartree fock answer. And we see for that we get a straight line. And we see for FMO2 and FMO3MD that we actually don't get energy conservation. And this is really, really bad. Like, I talked to the classical MD people about this problem. They looked at me like I was crazy. Because the idea of having an analytic gradient like, is just totally fundamental to what they do. It doesn't make sense that you, you, you would have pieces of your gradient missing. And so this means your ensemble doesn't actually generate correct statistics. And so people had published a lot of applications of FMOMD, but they really weren't valid uh, uh, at all because uh, they weren't generating correct statistics for their ensemble. But, but this went on for you know, eight years. And so it's something we really didn't like. And so what we did, and what my research consisted of, and I had a poster of this a few years back, was we went in and added the response terms. And so we went and saw these couple of perturbed hartree fock equations to make that gradient fully analytic. Uh, and so it used something called the z-vector approach, kind of similar to how we do the monomer calculations. So we calculated something called the z-vector in the field of the other z-vectors. Uh, and so this was just for hartree fock We extended it so we could do electron correlation with MP2 and, and something with an approximate electrostatic potential that I didn't really talk about earlier. Uh, right now, I'm currently extending it to DFT, where basically I'm debugging that to where when that's done, I can graduate. And uh, it, it's over a factor of 10 times more accurate. It's actually a little more. So to give you an idea, this is a gradient calculation compared to a numerical gradient on just 64 waters. So it's kind of hard to see here with this color, but we see the uh, air of the old gradient in yellow. You see how it's high, and you see how the new gradient is just right there uh, next to the numerical. So for like the max gradient air, we're more accurate by a factor of 30. And for the RMS, we're more uh, accurate by about a factor of 20. And, and we tested on, on multiple systems, not just water. And this is a very general result. And, and it worked really well, and we were really happy with that. So the next thing we did is we went and tested energy conservation to, to show that you needed to use this analytic gradient uh, if you're going to do MD. And so my uh, prof back home, he really hates log-log graphs. So this graph is not in log-log form. Him and I had a big argument about that. But anyway, the, uh, the, the key here is we look at the MOMD and the FMO with the response terms added. You see we're basically on top of each other. And, and so that means we're getting uh, uh, energy conservation now for our microcanonical or MBE ensemble. Uh, and we compare it to the no response terms, and you see we, we get that same junky uh, result. And, and so, so this was very good. We, we published a paper about this last year. And uh, I kind of take perverse pride in the fact that really, like, all FMO and D application research has kind of stopped in the past nine months because uh, the people that do the applications use a rival program that doesn't have the analytic gradient. And so, like, like they haven't been able to do anything. Uh, I haven't been super interested in, in applications right now because I've been working on method development. Uh, so we're starting the point to where we're going to start doing applications ourselves, but we still haven't kind of reached there. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, the, the, the main takeaway of, of this is that FMO and D requires a gradient that includes response terms. Uh, this seems really basic and really fundamental that you need an analytic gradient to, to do correct MD. But this is something w with the FMO community that you know, for eight years just was kind of swept under the rug uh, and, and just kind of ignored. And, and we continually brought this up at, at conferences, but, but no one seemed to care uh, uh, just because it was what they had, and so it's what they did. Uh, so, so that's the main takeaway here. 
uh, one of the problems, so another reason we don't have results, is it's still really computationally expensive. So having each OMD is, is really hard to do because uh, you know, each, each step takes 10 minutes and you need 40,000 steps. You know, 10 minutes for an ab initio calculation is not that bad. Uh, so it's still computationally expensive, and we're still kind of working on uh, ways to, to reduce the cost of a calculation, maybe using uh, some, some more classical things. So yeah, so the, the, that's basically the, the idea of my talk. Uh, so thanks, uh, Iowa State University. So Mark Gordon's my advisor. Uh, National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology in Japan. So the late Takeshi Nagata helped me with a lot of the gradient work. Uh, Dmitry Fedorov's kind of Mr. FMO out there. Uh, thank you to the Krell Institute as well. So the Krell Institute's actually based out of Ames, Iowa, which is where I'm from as Iowa State as well. But it's kind of funny because I only see them when we both fly across the country to, to, to meet in D.C. I occasionally run into them at a basketball game, but, but other than that, I, I have to come to D.C. to, to say hello and, and, and talk to them. So uh, with that, uh, I'll take uh, any questions anyone has.